Okay, thank you everyone for joining us and folks online as well. Um, I'm Jody. I'm one of the Chimiquita Firewise people. I'm being signaled to move over. Um, one of the Chimiquita Firewise leaders. And um, today is a joint workshop with Aldercroft Heights. They live across the canyon, and we are here with very different climates that we live in, uh, but we're all affected, obviously, by fire in our area. Um, we have Joel Loucher from the California Department of Insurance. And Mary Beth, I'm sorry, Mary Beth Bykowski from the California Department of Insurance and Joe Loucher from United Policyholders. And I'll take a little more of their background in a moment. Um, I wanted to ask the Aldercroft Heights leaders if they could just introduce themselves. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm Marjorie Klein. I'm from Aldercroft Heights and one of those leaders, and we're excited for this first get together. But have you get a part? Great. Um, this is our first kind of collaborative workshop. Yep. And then, Chen Peter folks, Dana. So I'm Dana Hartzell, and I'm one of the board of directors for Chen Peter. Um, and we are also happy to have you both here to help us navigate through the, the new insurance. Thank you. Okay. Great. Everyone's all married to Dana. Okay. Um, Another firewise person in the community. Uh, Mara Milanich, online. I am a firewise person. <laughs> <laughs> She's our fearless leader. And Rich? Oh, Rich Braxton, we're talking about firewise, also me. All right, thank you. Um, so, just to show of hands, how many people here have had a non renewal and folks online could also put a hand up? Sort of. So almost, almost everyone not getting it. Okay. <laughs> Are people online able to indicate if they have been non-renewed? Um, I don't think we're there yet. Okay, sounds good. All right. So Mary Beth is going to talk with us first. Um, she is an outreach analyst uh, in the Community Relations and Outreach Branch for the California Department of Insurance. The name you might be most familiar with is Ricardo Lara. He's the head of the department. Um, this was kind of interesting to me that the California Department of Insurance is the largest consumer, consumer protection agency in the state, and California has the largest insurance market in the country and the fourth largest insurance market in the world. So you can imagine the scope of the problem when you look at our little microcosm here. Um, the function of the department is to protect consumers and provide education and information. That's specifically the work that Mary Beth does. Um, and Mary Beth lives up in El Dorado County, so extra special thanks for traveling here. And she used to live down in town, so she's got some familiarity with our area. So okay. thank you. All right. Well, thank you for the invite to be here today. Okay, next slide. So as you are aware of, of the stress on the insurance market right now, created by natural disasters and global inflation. This is just not happening here, but every state is experiencing these factors. The increased cost of rebuilding, the labor insurance shortages, reinsurance is harder to find and costlier. And as we've seen, as risk increases, insurance companies are protected, their obligation to current consumers and limiting new business. Next slide. So reinsurance is the insurance that the insurance company. Yes. Available. Yes. And it's a global market and it's really tight right now because things have been happening on a global scale, right? Okay. So even though many insurance companies are currently still selling homeowners insurance, 12 insurance groups control 85% of our California insurance market. Think about that, right? And since 2022, seven of these top 12 insurance groups have either paused or restricted new business despite the rate increases approved or pending with the Department of Insurance. We call that, C we call our department CDI. Um, next slide, please. So clearly this is a problem. It's complex and global in nature and it's affecting all of us and it cannot be solved by just increasing the prices. So you can see the list there, the companies that have paused or pulled out, Shell is only writing in non-risk areas now. Next slide. Over the past 10 years, insurance companies have done worse in California than nationally by any measure, 
We find that hard to believe because we feel like it's expensive, but we are below the national average for prices. During those years, California experienced nine of the 10 most devastating wildfires in our state's history. So as a result, we're faced with a tough question now. Can consumers get the insurance they need? Unfortunately, today, as some of you know, the answer is generally no. Next slide. So how did we get here? Since 2019, we've been monitoring, and before that, I'm sure, monitoring and analyzing the status and the direction of insurance availability trends. The FAIR plan has doubled to over 3% of the market, becoming the insurer of first resort for many Californians and not the last resort as it was designed to be. The FAIR plan is not a state agency. It is run and funded by the insurance companies. A growing FAIR plan is a problem because policyholders are required to pay more for less coverage, and it's concentrating the high-risk properties under the FAIR plan that increases the chance that it will be unable to afford a catastrophic disaster. So that's an important point to realize. If the FAIR plan goes insolvent, insurance companies are on the hook for the unpaid uh, FAIR plan losses. And while this hasn't happened in nearly 30 years, the uncertainty is still driving insurance companies to further limit coverage to at-risk um, Californians. So a growing FAIR plan creates risk for the entire insurance market. As a direct result of the growing risk concentration, the credit agency AM Best has downgraded outlooks for top 12 companies like State Farm, AAA, and Mercury. So this is affecting them. And there is a critical fact to know that unlike, unlike public utilities, which are required to provide coverage to all residents and businesses, under Prop 103, insurance companies are legal to refuse to write insurance unless they're able to meet 100% of consumers' claims, cover their expenses, and earn a fair return. So everyone is harmed if an insurance company goes insolvent because it cannot play, pay its claims, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Next slide, please. So in an effort to reduce the risk of major losses in the industry, the department introduced Safer from Wildfires framework. Some of you may have heard about it, but I want to provide a high level overview. It's a three step system to protect your home, your surroundings and with the community, which in turn provides consumers with discounts and transparency about your risk rating. Under this regulation, we expect to see more businesses, homeowners, communities making investments in wildfire safety, greater community resiliency, reduced losses from wildfires, and hopefully as a result, more insurance coverage for mitigated properties. This regulation attacks the root cause of non-renewals, which is wildfire risk, and they will make Californians safer. Next slide, please. So quickly we'll go through these. Step one, this is pretty state, um, straightforward. Your class A fire rated roof, have your eaves enclosed, fire resistant fence, multi-pane windows, and a minimum of six inches of non-combustible vertical clearance at the bottom of the exterior of the structure. Next slide, please. Step two, protect the immediate surroundings. So do things like clear up your vegetation and debris from under your decks. Move all combustible materials from within five feet of the building being evaluated, that's your residence and removal of combustible structures, sheds, and other outbuildings from the immediate surroundings to your home to at least a distance of 30 feet. If you don't have 30 feet, just move it to the furthest uh, portion of your yard. Next slide, please. And finally, step three. This is an effort to be, become a community level mitigation designation. You're all in the Firewise group, so you've all done that. Thank you very much. Next slide. That's okay. So when you do the mitigation steps, your insurance company will provide you a discount. The California Fair Plan began offering insurance discounts in August of 2023, and CDI is working to continue improving the rates of the other companies. The Fair Plan has offered a 10% discount for on policies participating in a FireWise community since May of 2018. 
Now, when you're on the fair plan and you haven't been getting that discount, call your broker and let them know. One, uh, they also are offering two more, more discounts, one for protecting the structure and another for protecting the immediate surroundings of the dwelling. So when applied, these premium discounts will reduce by 10% and 5% respectively. Homeowners should contact a broker to find out how to qualify and when they could receive a discount. Now they bundled these together. Um, with a, within our regulation, they were all separated. So you could get a discount for each item that you do, but the fair plan handled it differently. Now the fair plan didn't have to um, agree to this as well, and they have. So we're really happy that they came forward with these um, reductions. Additionally, CDI and the California Fair Plan reached an agreement to increase the commercial uh, coverage limit to 20 million per location as of November of last year. This addressed the greater needs for additional coverage for recreational youth camps, HOLs, agricultural groups, and such. And also the business owner's policy also increased to 20 million in December of last year. So another thing I'd like to discuss is that most people, when we do these meetings all across the um, state for the last couple of years, a lot of people don't know that they are given a sign to restore to their property. So it's important to get that score because you know about what your risks are and what's hurting you. You can take actions to help mitigate that. And they're all, they also have to tell you what went in your score now, what factors will help determine that score. So this new wildfire risk score classification must be provided to you at the following times. Within 15 days of when you apply for a new policy, at least 45 days before you renew a policy, at least 75 days before you are non-renewed, and within 30 days of when you complete mitigation on your property and request a new score. Also, for the first time, you have the right to appeal. So if you're not happy with what's been determined, we can do whatever we can legally to follow the law, but call our department and you can fill out a request for assistance form. Excuse me. Are you talking only about the fair plan? Yeah. Is, so not about a private insurance. No, no. The fair plan is the ones I've talked about where their rates have been approved. Right? They're offering that discount. Discount. So but okay. as far as your risk score and getting that, everybody, every homeowner should be able to um, get their risk score down. Okay, if I understood what you were saying, for the fair plan, those discounts are through, but not for the private, but the risk scores. Yes, are and the ability you can get from any. Correct, and the ability to appeal. I actually got my um, risk score last summer. The rates haven't been um, accepted yet. For I have farmers, but and when I asked for the risk score. They were like, wait a minute, what? You're supposed to get a risk score? So very nice. They called me back about two hours later and they told me my risk score. They didn't give me all my factors, but they their rates haven't been approved yet. So speaking of, what is the range of the I'm risk just, score? I'm sorry. We're gonna ask that everyone sorry. um hold that oh, uh, hold questions till the end and actually after both speakers speak because they might cover your questions. Okay. And then um we set up the workshops so we'll have plenty of time for QA as well as for folks who are online as well. Thank you. Now, don't apologize. We, we weren't clear. Okay. Next slide, George. So, in addition to the safer from wildfire regulation and the improvements to the FAIR plan, the department embarked on another package of regulatory solutions. We call it the California Sustainable Insurance Strategy, SIS for short. Here are the executive actions and reforms that we are taking. One, we will increase availability of insurance in wildfire distressed areas. Using our prior approval <clears throat> rate authority, insurance companies will write no less than 85% of homes and businesses in wildfire distressed areas. This is a historic agreement between the department and the insurance companies. We will reverse the trend of a growing fair plan and close the insurance gap and the department will define these distressed areas using a data-driven approach. The second important, of the plan, important part of this plan is we will return fair plan policyholders back to traditional insurance with first priority given to hardened homes and businesses following the safer from wildfire regulation. The next important element of the plan directly addresses the climate crisis. 
crisis, the department will introduce regulations to utilize the full forward looking catastrophe models, the CAT modeling, prioritizing wildfire safety, mitigation, and transparency. So these models must recognize the clear benefits of investments the state is making in wildfire safety, including the home pardoning, the fuel reduction, and prescribed fire. So we have a clear template about how to do this by following the Safer from Wildfire regulation. We will take input from the public um, and put the public's interest in safety and insurance access first as we did in that process. Another important element of stabilizing our marketplace in the face of climate change, we will also explore California-only reinsurance costs. Reinsurance is a tool that many insurance companies are using to manage their climate risks and continue writing policies. We want to underscore that this will not pay the cost for hurricanes, floods, and fires across the country or around the world. It will only affect the cost that are incurred here in California. So under this agreement, companies wishing to use these new risk assessment tools must agree to increase and maintain their writing in the wildfire distressed areas of the state. That's the 85% requirement we just talked about, increasing in writing and removing people from FAIR plan. One last thing about the FAIR plan, we are continuing to work with them to expand commercial coverage limits to 20 million per structure. So this closes the gap for HOAs and ag businesses. Next slide, please. Lastly, I want to share some of the online tools on our website to help you scour the marketplace. Search for our top 10 tips for finding residential insurance for a summary of the information. I have I brought that sheet for you and it's on our it's on our um, website. You could just click it on. Or and also our home insurance finder tool gives you contact numbers for licensed agents and brokers in your area. Um, and please, if you wish to file a complaint with the department, please call us if you want us to review your policy, if you've been canceled or non-renew and just have any sort of question. We Our 800 number is great. It's manned by compliance officers. They are the only ones that are allowed to actually look into your a specific policy and give you answers. Okay, and that's that's the presentation for today, and we'll answer questions after Joel is done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Joel uh, informed me that he grew up in Los Gatos. He went to Los Gatos High School with Olivia de Havilland. And his uh, best friend was a Chemikino resident, so someone might have a connection with, um, with Joel's friend who passed or his, his friend's family. Um, Joel was an insurance underwriter for five years, and then he worked with the California Department of Insurance for 35 years, um, leaving as a chief deputy commissioner. Um, he now works for United Policyholders, which is an advocacy group on behalf of people who are taking insurance or are, um, people who are, are insured. Um, and Joel also traveled a long way today down from Moraga, so thank you very much. Oh, thank you and for having me. Any questions after? Oh, uh -huh. All right, I'll just uh, start with the, I guess we'll get my PowerPoint up there. So I'll start with a uh, moment of nostalgia. Just mentioned I graduated from Los Cabos High School. This is my 50 year reunion coming up. So the question is uh, how many of you would go to, go to reunions? I'm not inclined to go. Uh, as you, you, you're going to guess by the end of my presentation, didn't have many friends. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I have uh, I do have one friend that helps put these on and loves them, and another friend who was a, a never reunion. I think uh, if I can use uh, one of those terms. So I'm still debating it, but um, I'm going to go to one. It's probably this one, I guess. Okay, I work for United Policyholders, as Jody just mentioned. Um, the focus of most of our work over the many years that United Policyholders has been around since uh, after the Oakland Tunnel fire has been to help claimants with their catastrophe claims. So obviously, I mean, you are thrown in a whole different world when your house burns down and uh, your whole neighborhood is burned and it just creates a lot of insurance chaos and in trying to collect that claim 
while you're living elsewhere, can't even live nearby. So that's how UP, as we say, got its start. Next slide, please. We are a nonprofit, so the assistance we give or the presentations we give are of no charge to the consumer, the claimant, the policyholder. Everything we do is paid for by grants and donations, so it's totally free. Next slide, please. And um, we're here, you know, invited for the same reason that Mary Beth was um, that this is a very challenging market for businesses and homeowners alike. Um, today, a lot of people are experiencing non-renewals. And then when they try to find new coverage, um, you know, their agent commonly says, I don't have anywhere else to place you. Often, your agent may say, but I could put you in the fair plane. And one of the things I'm here to say is don't give up that easily. You're not going to be able to work likely with just a single agent, but there are more than five or six or 10 companies that write insurance in California. And so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. You're going to want to shop the market, but you know, we do know premiums are going up pretty rapidly. Next slide, please. So there are homes that are eligible for coverage. There's just some a few steps you might uh, be able to take like this home would be eligible. Okay. So perhaps if you could raise the uh, level of Lexington a bit, <laughs> you might be able to achieve this level of uh, kind of mitigation around your home. Another option, next slide, please. This approach is also works as long as your uh, bra branch is non-combustible materials, <laughs> you, you probably will be uh, qualified for coverage. I don't know if that reflects any of the homes around here. Next slide, please. So despite, um, despite the cost of insurance, one thing we always do like to, to put out there is to make sure you have adequate insurance. That is a major issue that comes up every time we go to a, a catastrophe loss event. Uh, the majority of people, typically 80% or more, are underinsured and often significantly. Your insurer needs to send you a, a estimate of replacement costs. I think some of them do it every year. I think they're required by law to do it every other year. And you get this, uh, this happens to be one from uh, my prior insurer. Um, and it looks you know, very thorough. It tells me what the cost would be to rebuild, you know, things about my structure. And it comes out, this one comes up to uh, about $530,000. And I have about a 2,000 square foot home. And that was is less than $300 a square foot. So despite how official and organized it looks, that is not nearly enough money to rebuild my home. So despite you know what you, you are getting, and it's nice that they are trying, um, you really want to get an estimate of what is the ballpark of rebuilding your home. And today, I don't think any home in California likely can be built for less than 350 a square foot. If you start adding in marble and you know, all the, the other touches, it's going to be 450 and 500 and more. And you know, if you need a difficult foundation, then you this. So one thing we still say, despite raising costs, probably at least within the range of reasonable in terms of your insurance limits, right? It's a tough time to be increasing your limits when the premium's going up, even at the limit you're at, but it's still important to have reasonable coverage limits because if you do need it, you want it to be something that's gonna be helpful to rebuild. Otherwise, people end up selling their lots is what happens at a discount. Next slide, please. So another thing we always advise people just in terms of insurance, you know, have it, making sure you're taken care of uh, for your contents. There's a lot of battle over contents if there's a major loss. And one thing that can 
very much help you in your claim situation if this ever occurs. We're not saying it will, and likely it never will, but you still want to do this, which is do an inventory of your home. Now, we have workbooks that we give out, and you can go down and write down everything you have and when you bought it and you know the condition it's in. And that's way more work than most people want to do. So what we do recommend, at least, is walk through with your phone and just take a video of everything you're in your phone. You know, keep that in the cloud. So at least you have evidence of what you had, right? If you ever do have to make a claim, you can show, look, this is, here's this room, here's this furnishing. You know, you don't have to debate over every couch and, you know, knickknack that you have on the shelf. You show the style of life you've had. But you also want to open your drawers, your cabinets, your closets to show your clothing, to show your dishes, to just demonstrate, you know, that I had all these things. It makes the claims process a much easier as one of the hardest parts of the claims to resolve. Next slide, please. So um, to address the kind of the big ticket item, uh, what happens if you're non-renewed? So as Mary Beth mentioned, to get a, if you get a non-renewal notice, well, first the insurer is obligated to send that out 75 days in advance. And that, that's been increased the amount of time to that 75 days because so many people are in this situation today. And it's likely going to take a while to find coverage if you can. But the first thing I mentioned is just don't rely on your agent. Um, any one agent might have six companies, they might have 10. Many of the same companies you've heard of again and again have already been kind of maxed out. If you go to that top 10 list that uh, Mary Beth also mentioned and has the flyer back there, I happen to like this a lot because I wrote this one. <laughs> and so, um, but it has a lot of, it, the 10 tips are different things you can do, different tools the department has. There are really over like 100 companies that write homeowners insurance. Some of them, you know, limit it to mobile home or other specialties. But there are many more companies than you may have heard of that write coverage. Most people are, you know, State Farm, Allstate, maybe Travelers or something. Uh, but there are many companies, and so you just got to find enough agents to, you know, that might have one that makes coverage available. And I'll tell you one other thing that is both frustrating but makes you keep going. Uh, this carrier I had actually dropped its financial rating just recently, and my mortgage company said, you got to find a company with a, a higher financial rate. And they're like, wow, that, this comes up now, right? When it's hard to shop. So I tried several companies and one of them placed my coverage and put it with Travelers. So Travelers was still writing. And so I told this other agent, hey, I found coverage, you know, elsewhere. And I said this with Travelers. And that agent said, oh, I represent Travelers, but they only let me write one policy a month. And so I didn't couldn't offer it to you, but it's interesting. But but it tells you you might try that same agent three weeks later, and you happen to get that one golden ticket. So it, it's a very challenging market. I've heard of other agents who can sell like six policies a month with some carriers. So even though they might represent travelers, and you think. You, contact somebody else, you know, well, I've already tried Travelers. You haven't necessarily tried that company yet because of the way they're kind of spoon feeding their agents some ability to write coverage. So we have a, a brochure in the back. It's also online at uphealth.org. I'll leave some of these here. So those of you who are uh, attending from home can pick them up. Uh, uh, trying to help you, how you look for coverage. And really, um, the FAIR plan, of course, we say insurer of last resort, and uh, as Mary Beth said, insurer of first resort often today. It could be where a lot of people would end up being placed. 
you know, honestly, as I drive in here, I see a very challenging landscape and would expect that this could happen or has happened to a lot of people here. And I do say, even if that happens, you know, don't just assume I'm there forever. You know, just, I, I think it's worth trying every few months to go out and go through that market again. You know, maybe you missed that one traveler's policy that would have been uh, written. It's going to be tough. And insurers, I think, are kind of doing this um, move right now of shutting down coverage, not just because of the risk, but to try to ease some of the regulatory constraints. Uh, I, I kind of feel, well, this could be my, you know, something in my head that's off, a little bit suspicious of insurers. Uh, most people are totally trusting of the insurance industry. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of feel like, you know, they're, they're fed up with the limitations on rate that Proposition 103 puts on them. And this is a way a little bit to take advantage of this situation, to break those bonds and get a little more leeway in the regulatory market. Next slide, please. So uh, again, uh, there's a, a, a slide. This is uh, home residential insurance that has uh, from the department that has many uh, links to helpful tools. The insurance finder tool is one, insurers offering discounts. Eventually all of them will be offering those mitigation discounts, but um, you know, the unfortunate part is while you can get a discount, it doesn't guarantee that you will get coverage with an insurer. So it's, it's a rate thing, not an eligibility thing. Next slide, please. And again, the fair plan, uh, you know, just to be clear, is a pretty much a fire policy. It does not cover water damage. And of course it doesn't cost, uh, cover things like flood or earthquake, but it is a very limited coverage form. And many insurers sell a, a, a policy that accompanies it, uh, a companion policy typically referred to as either a difference in conditions policy, a DIC, or a wraparound policy. And if you have any level of uh, you know, want to do some protection of your finances or your estate, you're going to need to buy that coverage for the liability coverage alone, right? You don't want to slip and fall that cost you your property just because you don't have uh, any liability coverage. So you can have to buy the DIC. The DIC itself probably costs as much as your homeowner's policy used to cost. So now you're into like a double cost kind of situation because DICs themselves aren't inexpensive. So next slide, please. So, you know, one of the things that has happened since wildfire risk scores have evolved is there are more differentials being identified between a place that's here and a place that's there. And this is a little representation of Los Gatos is in the upper circle. And here we are in Chemiquita Park in the lower circle, right? So these are gonna have entirely different wildfire risk scores. Mm -hmm. A thing that wasn't even part of the rating process before. Before we had territory and we had fire department ratings, but those didn't uh, distinguish as much between, you know, how steep a hill you were on, or how densely forested the area was. So that's happened in these last few years. Next slide, please. So you may have heard that State Farm got approval from the Department of Insurance to allow, to uh, State Farm can roll out a 20% rate increase on homeowners insurance. And this is just an education piece for you. I'm, hoping maybe you're interested. So State Farm is going to increase its rates, but it doesn't mean it's going to increase every, everyone's rates by 20%. 20% is the average. And what this slide has here, and it may be a little difficult to see, 
In the rate filing, they identify how much rate increase or decrease there will be by zip code. And I happen to highlight here 95030, which is Los Gatos, right? And 95033, I think is uh, here in Chanquita Park. And you can see on this, if you can read it, that the average, so 20% is the average rate increase. For the Los Gatos zip code downtown, the average increase is actually 15.3%. So lower than State Farm's overall increase. But the increase here is 35% more than the 20%, obviously. But also understand that those are averages, meaning some people in Los Gatos won't Everybody in Los Gatos will get a 15.3% increase. Some will get a 5% increase. Some will get a 20. And the people in Chamaquita Park, some of them will get a 20, and some will get a 50% increase. So that's rolling your way if you're in Chamaquita Park. So, you know, something to watch out for. And one of the industry complaints, of course, is uh, there's a rapid escalation of construction costs. So that's kind of ramping up uh, their need for reinsurance and fires can cause more costs of destruction. Well, of course, that also rolls into your homeowner's uh, limits. So if you had a home that was $500,000 last year, you're house limit for the dwelling, you probably will see that amp up a little bit too, because insurers apply a construction inflation factor to your dwelling, right? So each year, your dwelling limit goes up a little bit. So you'll see that go up and then compounded uh, with the rate increase. So you're going to see some pretty major premium increases and State Farm is just, they're kind of typical of where the whole industry is going. There are an array of rate filings uh, waiting for the department's approval. Some are much more than 20%, actually. So um, it's just, I, in my time in insurance, and it's been over 40 years, this is the most challenging market and uh, fastest escalating pricing that I have seen. Next uh, slide, please. So just, you know, overall, despite all this, uh, you wanna still try and have somewhere in the range of reasonable limits for your dwelling. You wanna kind of look through and make sure, you know, you're covered where you need, need be. Replacement costs, extended replacement costs, building code upgrade, those are all kind of built into a homeowner's policy and you usually don't get to choose your limits they are percentages of the dwelling limit, but different companies use different percentages. Some have a 20% extended replacement cost uh, piece that gives you a little buffer if your uh, value, construction value on your home is inadequate. Some companies have a 50% extended replacement cost, uh, extended replacement. That gives you a lot of buffer to be wrong. So kind of look at how, you know, what range of extended replacement costs you get, a little bonus coverage. Um, things like art, jewelry, business property, you need, they have very limited limits built into the policy. You know, it might be a thousand max for jewelry. And if you have a nice wedding ring, you'd want to schedule that individually and get a, you know, an a, a estimate. Um, and no, of course, flood, earthquake, mold, earth movement, a lot of these things aren't covered. And one of the things, of course, mountain communities sometimes suffer is mud flow. And so that's one, I mean, you want to do all you can to protect your community against it, because it is typically not covered by a homeowner's policy. Um, next slide, please. So again, you want to, you know, shop around. And it's going to mean calling way more agents than you may have been used to. Um, 
find out all the discounts the insurer offers. That set of mitigation discounts is, uh, as Mary Beth mentioned, in the works for a lot of insurers. But there were many insurers that already offered mitigation discounts. And unless you've asked them about that in the last few years, you probably being non uh, being renewed without receiving those. You need to tell them for you to get them. So get any discount and raise your deductible. A lot of us, uh, insurance world for most of us is grudgingly once a year renewing your homeowner's policy. You know, just okay. You know, you put it aside for a week because you don't want to pay, and then you pay it, and then you forget about it for another year. But I'm going to say at the very least, so if you've had that same policy for years, you might have set it with a $500 deductible. One $500 seemed like a lot of money. But in today's world, you want to push that deductible up to $5,000 or $10,000 because you really don't want to use your homeowner's policy. They say, you know, insurance coverage isn't for maintenance. It is for major needs. So you don't want to use it unless you have you know, and you can't financially take care of something yourself. And if you make a claim with many insurers, you're going to lose your claims free discount. So you don't want to use it. You know, you, it could turn into you losing the coverage. So have a high deductible. Get a, get the discount you can for not using coverage. Next slide, please. And I'll skip the next slide. These are just the... Uh, same discounts that Mary Beth mentioned and are on uh, some handouts back here. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So the key is to obviously do what you can around your home. Here, it's more important than in many places for you to do both what you can at your home, but to act as a community. Uh, obviously, um, you know, your neighbor is going to impact your risk of loss. And so FireWise is fantastic that you have that here. And, um, you know, I hope you can, hopefully the, uh, the premiums going up will convince other people it's time to join in and mitigate their properties if you have some people reluctant to, uh, in uh, making the changes they need. Next slide, please. And I uh, want to mention the United Policyholders website. We have a lot of help and information about mitigation work that you can do or things that are taking place. You really want to engage your county fire departments, Cal Fire, any local fire department to see if there's anything they're willing to do in terms of getting grants to get work done, shaded fuel breaks, that type of thing, things that are beyond a homeowner doing, but that you know government needs to do. Next slide. We have some guides here from Listos, uh, California, um, provides this information from the state and uh, they have a lot of great information also to help you uh, mitigate your risk and get ready for any disaster that can occur. Next slide, please. In uphelp.org, which uh, I'm trying to represent here as best I can. And uh, hopefully you'll come to us. You can write in, ask an expert if you have specific problems or um, contact us with any of your questions. I think that's it. Next slide. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That was a lot. Right? That was a lot. Sorry. So we'll take questions. I want to point out, uh, George and I lost our coverage a few months ago, and in the process of trying to secure something, actually got a home ticket. And I had just talked to Joel, and he explained how you know one agent might be able to write one policy per month, and it must be what happened for us because we got a policy with UA USAA. And according to the data that was shared today, they're not writing policies in high risk areas. So we, we kind of, we were in shock when it all went through. So we, but, but that said, we feel like we have a year now, right? And then we're probably gonna be back in the same place. 
Um, so we'll just do questions live instead of we're going to have them um, in writing. Mara, how do you want to do the online questions? I don't have any online questions yet. Okay, so maybe you can slip those. Um, if anybody on Zoom wants to write okay. in, please feel free to. Um, I wanted to start with a question that I have. Both Alder Crop Heights and Chemakita, our FireWise communities, are working with local fire are working with Fire Safe Council. We have actually, it's hard to tell, but um, there are uh, shaded fuel breaks that have been done. San Jose Water Company owns all the land between us. There's been a huge uh, fuel break that's been created there. Um, Brown's done major work with um, various entities and work along Old Santa Cruz Highway. The whole Highway 17 corridor up to the summit has been done. And still, there's so much to do. Um, one question that we have that we haven't been able to kind of figure out is, and I know this might not be your purview as much, but can you refer us to any organizations that might be helpful in providing grant funding beyond like Cal Fire level, especially for the neighbors who want to do something but are on fixed income perhaps and just aren't able to put a new roof on or to do something that's you know a costly improvement to their home. We have a grants page with links to other organizations. That's the best way that I can tell you to hit our website for that mm -hmm. um, because that gets updated regularly. Okay, that's great. Yeah, we might, I think on that uh, Get Prepared page, we, by county, uh, you might find some grants that are available there in the different districts offering. Mm -hmm. And we did hear a rumor that they're going to try to make the grant process a little easier maybe making it more regional mm -hmm. instead of the tiny little neighborhoods because sometimes you're not the ones that get it right as you're you know large enough right okay great um after people ask a question if you want to just take them directly if you could repeat the question so that okay. people on zoom and the report you can hear it sure. yeah, question uh you spoke about this firewise uh 10 discount uh wildfire risk score uh how is that how would that be honored by an, an insurance company or an underwriter like they could say oh you have you're a firewise area you've done all this work they wh why would they honor that or do they have to honor that this is why would an insurance company honor the 10 percent firewise discount that specifically was for the fair plan because their rates have been approved. Well, that's for the fair plan. That's for the fair plan only. The other ones are all going to be individual. Yeah, so from but, each company. Yeah, but by law, every insurer has to implement a firewise discount along with each of the discounts that are in the regulation. But they had to apply for approval to how they're going to amend their plans. And to be honest, most of the insurers are kind of implementing kind of placeholder discounts, like two or three percent for some of the some of these um, actions you take, such as the having uh, ember proof screens or ember resistant screens. Uh, they every insurer by the probably the end of summer, I, I would say this year, they'll all have that list of discounts. It will be built into their plan and they'll be asking presumably for evidence. Do you, have you done any of these things so they can amend your rating uh, accordingly? But you'll, you may want to check with your agent to see has this company implemented these yet? But they, they will be asking once they're implemented on your next renewal. Okay. I. <laughs> In dealing with my farmer's agent, uh, he said that he could not talk to the underwriters. And I'm thinking, is this like the Wizard of Oz where there's someone behind the screen? Yeah. Why, why would why would an agent, maybe he's just not a good agent, but why would why wouldn't an agent advocate? Because I did I did a ton of work at the house, I showed them evidence, I cleaned everything up, I lit in trees, it was a substantial cost to me. And then there's, I can't talk to an underwriter. I don't understand. What's the dynamic there? In other words, short question. Well, I, what is the dynamic? What, what authority does an agent have? Is I guess the question. I mean, typically an agent.
communicates up through a chain, uh, chain of command that is related to agent appointments and agent training and agent management. So they typically do not contact directly underwriting or finance or it's just everything as in many large companies is its own pillar. Right. And you reach out through that channel to cross over to ask the other channel what they're doing. You know, an agent would probably, you know, there are thousands, of course, of farmers agents or state farm agents, and probably many of them, since they are embedded in the community and they're hearing direct from policyholders, are communicating their complaints up the ladder. But it's up to the corporate office to determine what messaging is going to be communicated to the consumer. It's just kind of the way it is in corporate America generally. And I think in this particular circumstance that insurance is in today, they are very cautious about what they want to communicate. Uh, yes, because I, I, I think they are, uh, you know, whatever they have whatever they end up doing, they have to do it consistently for, for everyone, right? Insurance is about consistency in terms of how much you pay and who is eligible and how a claim is paid. Everything, there are a set of laws for most of it. All rates are laid out in law. Insurers can't adjust them without getting the department's approval. Claims handling regulations determine how claims are paid. So an agent really has little leeway or authority to change things other than send it up the ladder and probably is told, don't blame your up the ladder folks for you not being able to answer, right? They don't say, well, I told corporate and they don't get back to me, right? You don't want employees saying that. So they probably say, you know, I'm still waiting an answer or something, or I, I can't communicate directly with the rate making people. Thank right. you for the clarification. I appreciate your answer. Yeah. I think mine is very related. Um, I have a property next to me that is vacant. It is owned and he does not maintain it. And I was not fully denied because I, I appealed the process, but I am now putting caution tape up every year to delineate my property line <laughs> And I'm cutting some of his property, but I can't do the whole thing. Maintaining mine and part of his. Now, at that point, we had yearly inspections. I have all state. And they came around and they actually inspected your property. I didn't have that happen this year. Are they now inspecting it airily and all this caution tape is going to do any I believe every company does it differently. And a lot of companies are using drones right now as well. So they are getting up close and personal. Yeah, and I would say uh, the wildfire risk scores actually used to be just slope, density of wood or brush and access. But now uh, it is much more granular. So they used to use satellite imagery, you know, way up high. Now they're down to aerial imagery, which gives you a much closer look and I, I know one of the things they do because there's a requirement, that, you know, the the safer from wildfire whole idea is 30 feet away from your home, as Mary Beth mentioned, or as far as you own. But the insurer is taking in, they'll give you the discount if you do what you own. But in terms of eligibility, they're still looking those 30 feet and beyond as well. So yeah, it, it isn't gonna, your tape probably, it's good, you know, to clear out at least so you have 30 feet on either side of your home is a measurement that insurers are going to look like at. So if you can get out on your neighbor's property and, I am, he is a but, <laughs> but generally they are going to take into account a broader, uh, you know, kind of look as well. So sort of related to that, you said everything has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. But then she earlier said, when uh, Mary Beth was talking, that 
85% of the homes in high risk area must be covered. So does that mean two equal homes, if they were equal on all things, one could end up being covered because they were in that 85% and another one not be covered? Isn't that an and, and that's that's the future with the SIS plan. That is an oh, end. Oh, it is yeah. a present. Yes, correct. Yeah, and, it, and it's actually each insurer's market share. So an insurer has a 10% mark. So there are, as mentioned, hundreds of insurers are writing homeowners. But Mary Beth pointed out that there's you know a dozen that write almost the whole market. So if they have 10% of the market. They are going to have to write 8.5% of the high risk business, right? Because 8.5 is 85% of 10. So they're going to have to write 8.5%. And you can imagine they will be competing to write the 8.5% of the high risk area that's the lowest risk. So it's, you know, they're going to. So it does come back to you could have two equal homes and one not be insurable and the other one be insurable, irrespective within the same company. Yeah, right? because they're not writing 100% of high-risk homes for one thing, right? So there, there are still homes that are gonna miss out for sure. While we're on the um, SIS plan, could you elaborate on the just, I guess, even politically, logistically, how is it that the um, Office of Insurance is able to uh, encourage, cajole, require the insurers to provide that much insurance in high risk areas, given that you know they're all pulling away from doing that. It just seems like such a such a push. So I'm just trying to understand. This all um, happened in um, September of last year. Um, mm -hmm. There was something going through the legislature which failed to, to get done. Um, unfortunately, because if that would have been quicker than us doing a regulation, which has all these little steps that you have to mandated to take. Um, so that's when the governor contacted the insurance commissioner and asked him to start on this next regulation. Um, so he got in on it right away. And from what I'm told, those deals with the insurance companies were already baked into what was going through the legislature. So that's how that came about. That's what I, you know, somewhat am told. Yeah, I mean, there's always a quid pro quo for uh, all business activity. The quid pro quo here is that currently insurers don't get to pass their reinsurance costs on to the policyholders. So under this format, the, um, they would be able to pass their California reinsurance costs. And obviously that's a big bonus to them because um, that's currently coming out of their profits. Uh, so there's a cost they'll take off their shoulders and put on the policy holders. And um, they are also going to get to use wildfire risk models. Currently, they use, uh, I, I would say, yes, an outdated format to predict future wildfire losses. But there are other ways to do that that are better than what they have today that aren't going to go as far as, as what this has. The bottom line is they will be charging a lot more premium. And that's that's how the insurers are going to agree to go there. And so the uh, government or the commissioner is choosing to make availability better, but at the expense of affordability, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And for those of you online, you can just raise your hand and we can unmute mute you, or you can post your questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Diana has a question. Diana, go ahead. No, oh, wait a minute. She has to unmute. Marjorie? Yeah, oh, Did you have a question? Yeah. Just riskfactor.com, is that a good site to go get your risk factors for? I don't know, I don't know about that one. Yeah, actually every insurer, or, uh, they all use different uh, mechanisms to give a risk score. So it just depends. 
a risk score from any entity like that can help you understand kind of where you measure up, but it may not be directly the one that your insurer uses. So, um, yeah, it just depends. And I know before my next renewal comes up, I'm going to be calling about three months ahead of time mm -hmm. and saying, what can I do now? Mm -hmm. So I think Diana has a question, but let me turn the volume up here. Okay. Diana, you have a question? I guess not. Hey, Diana, do you have a question? No, no, I got it all down. Thank you. I have an off topic but related question about earthquake insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, does your regular policy cover in the case of an earthquake, or how? Because everybody I've talked to has no answer on earthquake insurance. Can you take that up? Yeah. 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 yeah you, your uh, standard homeowner's policy does not cover earthquake. Um, every insurer that writes homeowners uh, is required to offer an earthquake coverage, not necessarily directly. Many of them use the California Earthquake Authority. Some use, uh, there's a couple other companies that write earthquakes specifically. Uh, Palomar comes to mind, I think is one I have. But uh, yeah, it is something you specifically need to purchase separately or you know you can go through the referral from your insurer but earthquake uh, as a peril is not included in the homeowner's policy and neither is flood now i know i have a friend up, i live in el dorado county we don't have a lot of earthquakes up there but when she lost her homeowners she was able to um, get covered by somebody else but they wanted her to buy earthquake insurance mm. And she said, why? We do not have earthquake in here. And she came from the Bay Area. And they said, well, it's another, it's really cheap because you don't have earthquakes and it's another bundle. So it brought her price down. So there's all these little tricks, right? Well, that's yes. I will say that a uh, fire following earthquake is covered. So um, and there is a peril there that insurers do cover. Cherry <laughs> thought. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you know, and the part you were talking about with your neighbor that doesn't take care of his property, I listen to a lot of the fire safe council meetings. They have regional meetings and they all talk about the um, just get together as your community. They buy chippers, they knock on people's doors. Hey, do you need help? I, it seems like things are overgrown. Can we help you? Not everybody can do that. But that's where the firewise and fire safe council can help. Well, there's no there's no property, there's no house. Okay. I have uh, house burned down. I've been walking my dog around yeah. this block of this empty lot for a number of years and finally it dawned on me, hey, I'm calling the fire department. They put a lien on the property. Yes, yeah, I would Ooh. they put a lien on the property, they came and mowed down the, the weeds and such. I, I would but, say uh we had the fire department. They said they will come and inspect your individual yeah. property. But does that really help? When you, well, you there, this lot got uh, its weeds mowed down, yeah. and then some a storm came, and one of the oak trees fell down and such, but, um, and that was cleared away. Mm -hmm. So it's worth it. I, I feel that fire departments in the past have been more hesitant to just create the friction with a lot of property owners. and. My experience is that they've got departments are getting a lot more aggressive in not tolerating the failure to maintain lots today and using liens and assessments and fines in a way that they just were hesitant or reluctant to do. Yeah, but they're putting their life on the lines now when they're fighting fires. So. Yeah, and the community is upset about, you know, these, uh, you know, potential risk factors created by neighbors like yours. Um, other people have questions I don't want to So so when you and I spoke on the phone, you kind of went into more detail about if someone gets a non-renewal, 
how to proceed, like how to start owning all these different companies, which sounds overwhelming mm -hmm. because there's so many. So I thought maybe you could elaborate on the strategy for people to use because I think so many of us are in that position of where do I begin? I hear you that there are lists and resources, but are we talking all 50 companies? And you know what what kind of what should people expect? Yeah, I think um if you're with an independent agent, so if you're not with State Farm or Allstate, for example, but an agent that represents, you know, half dozen companies, that's where you're going to start. And I think the key is to get started early. I mean, typically when you see bad news, you want to put it aside and like not think about that for a little while, which I understand and I'm uh, great at doing as well. Uh, but it, it is a process where you want to get going early because, as I mentioned, you might get a different answer a couple of weeks later, but if you've run out of time, uh, so start with your own agent, but don't, again, assume that, okay, they, they couldn't place you, but they can put you in the fair plan, that you settle for that. So that's why you want to start early. So you give yourself time to be contacting other agents so you want to contact State Farm or Allstate or Farmers as well, but then you want to ask your agent, what companies do you represent, right? So they give you a list, and at least you know you've covered those, sort of, like I say, there can be exceptions, so you don't want to give it up, but then you want to ask each agent you talk to, which which companies do you represent? So who am I hearing from? And tick off that list that you get from the department of the insurers that write homeowners coverage. So first thing I'd go to is the 800 number list on the department website of every insurer writing, and then just start working your way down that list. And you might call three independent agents and only have covered 10, 12 companies. So the 800 list is there for you to call the company direct and say, where is the agent close to me? Right? If they don't sell directly, tell me American Hardware Mutual, you know, where did, where's the closest agent to me? Maybe you live here and the agent's in El Dorado, but they can sell you a policy wherever you are in the state. You know, most agents aren't confined to a region. So just work through that 800 number list. Make sure you contact at least one agent representing every one of those companies. So that's where I'd go to first, the 800 numbers. So the 800 number you're talking about is, is that on? It's on that top 10 list um, that's at the department website. Yeah, it's a link. It's a link on okay. there. So to, yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah. Right, and you click on that. Uh, and you'll find all the companies writing, writing residential insurance coverage and their 800 number. Most of them won't do business with you directly, but they can refer you to a local agent. And also in El Dorado County, we had this one agent, unfortunately she moved to Tennessee, but she got, gathered a number of the insurance agents and they all worked together when somebody lost their insurance. They would call one, hey, it's like a phone line, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Can you help somebody? Can you get to cover this person here in this property? So maybe you have a group of insurance uh, agents that maybe through the Chamber of Commerce you can talk to or something to work together like that. Yeah. I was a Girl Scout, so. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay. oh, I have, so can different agents within the same company offer you different policies? No. How very officially or unofficially? They can, you know, different agents have different competencies, right, in making sure that they are serving your needs. But whatever agent you go to, they are going to quote you based on generally what the company is going to come up with in terms of the limit for your home. And they all use, each company has its own approved rates. So the premium should be identical from one agent to the next. One agent may be a little more savvy in noting that the company has a discount and asking you, hey, do you, you know, uh, you know, I see you have a dog, but we have a small dog discount. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, and so 
maybe they hone in a little more and find a little uh, bit of play into it. But the general rate for your home and the coverage limit are generally going to be determined at the corporate level. Mm -hmm. So agents, a good agent does make a difference, but not at the kind of macro level. Tying on to my earlier question, I think that I understood from a previous webinar that I watched is that if you end up on a fair plan, you don't want to just accept that and stay right. there. Yes. Um, could you elaborate on that some more? Because I don't think that was really covered today. Yeah, it's just, um, you know, you uh, need to jump in. I'm sorry. No, because um, I've met people at... Um, um, fairs that have gotten off the fair plan. Mm -hmm. And then if I tell that to somebody else, oh, that's not possible. Go talk to Bob over there. He just, mm -hmm. It just happened to him. Mm -hmm. People don't even realize that they think they're stuck there. It does take a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It does take a lot of time. Um, it could take you, you know, every, I would maybe do it every six weeks, try to st start calling other insurance agents. Um, you never know, like you have got that golden ticket. Right? Yeah, but, or, or the agent, you know, may have had somebody non-renew that went to another company, right, got a better deal, and they kind of are going to be allowed to sell a policy with the company where they lost one of their insurance. So there is turnover in their book of business that they're sometimes allowed to refill. And so it's, again, it, it is a timing thing, which is both frustrating and, you know, inconsistent, but it is kind of how things roll out sometimes that you get a different answer the third time you call three weeks later. And, and I'll tell you the motivating factor will be your fair plan and DIC premiums. Oh. Because if you're in the fair plan, you're in the pool of the highest risk. And so the rates are based on the biggest losses and are the highest rates. Plus you're writing, you're also having to buy that difference in conditions coverage. And it just adds up to a lot. So that will be your motivation to keep trying, I guess. Uh, well, listos is uh, Spanish means be prepared or ready. Uh, so I think that's where they got the name. Estoy listo, I'm ready. <laughs> Most people here are homeowners, um, not everyone. And so I, a question that I thought might be valuable for people listening or watching this later is if you are not a homeowner, but you are hoping to become a homeowner, do either of you have suggestions for, I mean, is it just the same as the rest of us, or is there anything if you jump to the bottom of the first time to be thinking about in terms of your insurance coverage? Yeah, I, I have a big one, and that is, when you're looking at a home that you be that you should be working with an insurance agent that is giving you an idea of the availability of coverage for that home and what the price will be. You know, if you are looking for a home that's whatever, five hundred thousand dollars, that's what you can afford, right? You have whatever eighty thousand down. But then you realize this isn't gonna be. 3,000 a year for insurance, this is going to be a thousand a month. Mm -hmm. Then obviously the home value price you can pay is going to be substantially different. And given the price of coverage today, our expectation is logically is that home prices where the premium is the highest are going to come down, right? To within affordability of the buyer that would buy it. So it's it's very true of, um, uh, Mary Beth mentioned condominiums needing additional coverage in the fair plan. Condominium premiums, because they have concentrations of values, have gone way up if they're in a high risk area. So your HOA for that, you know, starter home for some people has gone from 300 a month to 2,500 a month. Yeah. And obviously you didn't factor that in when you purchase that home. It, it is a, you know, it's such a, a mess. Yeah, it is a monumental challenge of just what insurance can do financially. Are they doing anything to make it not a mess? Yeah, it follows uh, insurance price, follows loss, right? 
So we've had the biggest wildfires in history. And until we put those a little further behind us in our rear view mirrors, through creating firewise communities and shaded fuel breaks and, you know. Mitigation of your home and yeah, your surroundings. The only thing that's gonna bring it down is a um, lowered risk to take the tree, right? Absolutely. So it's sad to know, but that's where we are right now. And it's not just, you know, it's not just fires, right? After we had all that snow and last year we hardly had any fires, what happened? And we had the floods come down, right? The mountains and some of those areas got hit, double hit, right? They had the Calder fire, then they had the, mm -hmm. you know, the flooding from that. And what happened in San Diego last week, three feet of uh, water in people's homes. It's, uh, we're in a different world right now. But if you do the mitigation of your home and property, the, the the saving grace maybe your your home may survive a catastrophic fire if one comes through the neighborhood so that should give you peace of mind and be worth doing so does each insurance company make their own risk assessment model and risk assessment value on your home so you could end up with different agent out of different uh, companies we were talking about that. yeah they, they don't each do their own they there are some larger entities they use oh. that they uh, choose who they use. When uh, this first rolled out wildfire scoring, there was uh, one called Core Logic and one called FireLine. And uh, I mentioned earlier, they just looked at access, fuel load, and uh, slope. And so you companies used, almost all companies used one or the other. Now there are multiples of those companies. They each give a score. And what insurers do is use that score, right? So every home has a score. Well, that's how they track, well, which homes have the most losses. And, you know, if the higher scores are having the most losses, then it plays out that this tool works, right? It's identifying higher risk. It's just the, the review point has got more granular to look at whether you have a class A roof. And they can now factor in what is the year of construction. That tells them some features of the home, like the vent types. So then you have to tell the insurer if you've changed your vents, right? But new builds today have to put in ember resistant vents. So that's built right into these evaluation tools. But there are multiple tools and insurers choose which one they use. But just like zip code, that score plays a role. The age of home plays a role. You know, the territory that you're in, multiple zip codes, your fire protection class. There are several factors, but your wildfire risk score is, you know, kind of the driver today. And then, so what you are saying is that you could go to one of farmers and you get one risk of the score. Yes, and go to the absolutely. Same farm and get a different one on the same home. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, with the SIS um, regulation that is being worked on, and I don't know really how it's going to play out in the end, but we have had a couple of workshops and where we've had a couple of these um, fire risk companies speak. And I think it was, I know CoreLogic was one, I'm not sure if the other one was FireLine, but they each said, based on the mitigation steps that are in Safer from Wildfires, the risk will go down 85% if homeowners do all that. That's major, wow. right? Think about that. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have any reason not to tell the truth, but mm -hmm. that really left an, oops, sorry. <laughs> left an impression on me. Mm -hmm. And so then also what we've been discussing is how do you, um, how are, uh, with the SIS, who's going to be doing that risk assessment? Um, because some companies don't want to talk about um, proprietary information. Um, so we're, that's all in the discussion now. Should we talk to Caltech and Berkeley and Stanford? Hey, we've got some smart people in California. I mean, that's all in the works. So not quite sure how that's gonna pan out, but that's all being worked on now. And these, this regulation, that's, mm -hmm. that's in, in effect. 
Are, are these for but that that regulation was passed and the insurance companies had to send all the rates to us for approval, but very few of them have been approved yet. It's a long process. He used to head that one of those branches. He's he's led every branch in our department. That's why I'm always letting John speak. So go ahead, John. <laughs> yeah, there were about a dozen insurers that already had most of those discounts in place. But you know, Mary Beth is saying that the regulations require everybody to put them in place. It's just it has to be approved, built into the rates um, through the approval process that determines. Um, like, like they're going to put in to the uh, into their filing what the amount of discount will be. And as I mentioned, since they didn't track these things, they only that they, they don't really know what the impacts will be. So you know, it's like you don't know until you measure something, you don't know what its effect is. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, I think they'll probably put in because they're being forced to do it and they don't have data to support it, very minor discounts. But uh, to Mary Beth's point about, you know, these entities say these are going to make a big difference. Yeah. They will prove themselves over time when the homes survive that are in the fire area that because they're mitigated and the house, you know, three doors down burns because it had all the wrong things, still a wood shake roof. So, um, the discounts will grow over time, but there will be a discount for everybody that does these actions. Probably by, yeah, next few months, I think. Um, how often do does a particular company have to send around their drones? I mean, how often are you getting assessed? For you? You, you can only be um, charged something eight, once a year. When your policy renews, it is renewed at the standards in place at that time, point in time. So when they renew you again, like they will have sent their drones out um, to you know, update if they're going to, what your score is or evaluation. So they, they, every year can change, but whatever they do actually has to go through an approval process with the department. So if they're going to, you know, if they give a um, a surcharge based on a score, that surcharge is approved by the department that it has been justified that risks with that score have had more losses. So it's it goes through a prior approval system that a lot of states don't have to make sure the company's charging only what they're Lost data shows is fair, but it can change year to year. It's not going to change mid year. Well, so I'm just wondering about, um, you know, when we do clearing, it's usually during the drier periods of the year. Um, and there's not really much point in doing clearing of leaves and stuff now. <laughs> um, so, and the drone coming around. If it was sent around now, it would show that you weren't being responsible or whatever, but you might be being responsible in two or three yeah. months. Yeah. <laughs> well, the oh, drones perfect. are not at a level, I, I, I'd say, of imagery that detects that the leaves from your maple tree or have fallen and they're laying next to your house. They're really looking at overhanging branches over the roof. They're looking at the density of brush around the home. And um, so, and actually that is a big one, overhanging limbs. That is one of the big changes from the uh, kind of gross look from way up in the satellite to today is they're looking at that roof line and they don't want anything hanging over it. But they're not measuring whether you Pull the weeds one week or not, they're looking at your broader landscape itself and what you have in place. To some degree, they do inspections for the type of vegetation you have. Um, what's the one that catches fire and everybody had? A, it was needed. Well, that's one. I'm thinking of like these hedges that people used to have. Uh, On the side. Juniper or. Yeah, 
<laughs> right, that were the thing of the 50s or Sunset Magazine, and uh, you know, and now it's like you better pull those out. May I jump in here real quick? Yeah. Uh, my name is Brad Hartzell. I'm a 35 year firefighter, uh, was with Santa Clara County Fire Safety Council for a while. I uh, worked on the Highway 17 shaded fuel break and ran all the projects on Old Santa Cruz Highway a while back, starting at Lexington School all the way to Summer Road. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So hazardous fuel reduction is a year-round project. So you're talking about how you do that. One of the things that's really most important, we're all dealing with the insurance issues. So what they're the information they're providing us is absolutely essential for us to understand. It. The other thing that has to come about is our responsibility as homeowners and property owners, whether you're a slum lord or you are paying your own mortgage. And as a community, which we're dealing with people in our community that don't take care of their property, right? We've got to figure out how to do that. I want to talk to you about how you've got county fire or county fire to actually come out and put a lien on the house because I haven't seen them, yeah. either fire agency being very supportive of that. Uh, so you have to take care of your property year round, right? Just because it's summer isn't necessarily a time to start your head to this fuel reduction project, it's year round. Mm -hmm. Right? So you talk about all the things that you can see here, the Fire Safe Council, Cal Fire's got a whole bunch of things, County Fire's got information out there. We have to take care of our property, and it's a year-round issue. You talk about branches over there. So the other issue that comes about is the insurance companies that come out and send their, their evaluators that come out, they have no idea what they're looking at. They truly don't. They, I've got a neighbor that they were complaining about their debt. Right? And I'm looking at their property from my perspective of my experience and going, that's what they hit on was the deck. <laughs> right? And so there's all these other things that go on. One of the other things, years ago, I was in charge of a, an updated for a countywide hazard mitigation program. So one of the things that came up during that is for, and I've said this a bunch of times and I'll continue to say it, every dollar you spend on hazard mitigation, whatever it happens to be on your property, We'll save you six dollars, count of six dollars in hazard mitigation or hazard recovery costs. All right? So we have to invest in these things. So if you invest in taking care of your property and maintaining everything that goes on it, when the insurance people come rolling in and they start digging you on stuff that I've done this, this, and this, and they've all brought that up. You get the bed screens. Our firewise group has got a role that you can go and upgrade your bed screens with, right? You just ask what you want, and you put all this together. So this is going to be an active participation by all of us. We can't sit on our hands and not be involved. We have to put in the work. And if you can't do the work yourself, there are resources out here that will help you do that. What we do here is important, right? And you have to put the effort in. You have to put the time. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any final questions? We're past 11.30. Okay, Mary Beth and Joel, we um, so appreciate your coming. And we get together with a little gift bag of very local items to wine. Uh, Gold gold bullion? Did you say gold bullion? Wow. That's my favorite. That's so sweet.